Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to Topic 3.6.4.3, Control of Blood Water Potential from the AQA A-Level Biology Specification. As always, let's start with a look at our specification. First of all, we need to know that osmoregulation is the control of water potential of the blood. We need to know the roles of the hypothalamus, posterior pituitary gland and antidiuretic hormone, which can be shortened to ADH, in osmoregulation. Finally, we need to know the structure of the nephron and its role in the following events. The formation of glomerular filtrate, the reabsorption of glucose and water by the proximal convoluted tubule, the maintaining of a gradient of sodium ions in the medulla by the loop of Henle, and finally, the reabsorption of water by the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts. So let's make a start. Osmoregulation is the control of the water potential of the blood. There are three main steps that we should know. Ultrafiltration, which is the formation of the glomerular filtrate. Selective reabsorption, which is the reabsorption of useful substances such as glucose, amino acids and ions. And then we have osmoregulation and the reabsorption of water. Here we have a diagram so you can see where all of the steps occur. We have the blood capillaries, which at the glomerulus is known as the glomerular capillary. Note that the end of the glomerular capillaries that enters the glomerulus is known as the afferent arteriole, and the end that leaves the glomerulus is known as the efferent arteriole. The first stage, ultrafiltration, takes place at the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. Then we have selective reabsorption, which occurs at the proximal convoluted tubule. And finally, osmoregulation occurs at the loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and collecting duct. So what happens first? First of all, we have ultrafiltration, i.e. the formation of the glomerular filtrate, which occurs at the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. Here I've drawn a diagram just to visualize this a bit more easily. We have the glomerular capillary as well as the capillary endothelium. We have a basement membrane and cells called podocytes as well as the Bowman's capsule. The efferent arteriole is smaller in diameter than the afferent arteriole, meaning that the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries increases. Small molecules are forced through a three-layer filter into the Bowman's capsule. They are forced through the capillary endothelium, which has many pores, the basement membrane, which is made of collagen, and podocytes, which line the Bowman's capsule. Larger proteins and red blood cells are too large to pass through. So what goes through? We have glucose, water, urea, amino acids, ions, and excess vitamins. All of this forms something known as the glomerular filtrate. Next, we have selective reabsorption. This occurs at the proximal convoluted tubule. Here we have the reabsorption of useful substances such as glucose, amino acids, and ions. These pass back into the blood capillaries wrapped around the proximal convoluted tubule. This is done in exactly the same way as in the lining of the ileum, by co-transport with sodium ions. This reabsorption lowers the water potential of the blood, meaning that water moves out of the proximal convoluted tubule into the capillaries by osmosis. Note that, as in the ileum, the epithelium of the proximal convoluted tubule has microvilli, which provide a large surface area for the reabsorption of materials from the glomerular filtrate. And finally, we have osmoregulation, which occurs at the loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. Note that the loop of Henle can be split into two parts, the descending limb and the ascending limb. At the loop of Henle, we lower the water potential of the medulla so that water can be reabsorbed at the descending limb, the distal convoluted tubule, and collecting duct by osmosis. So, how does the reabsorption of water actually work? At the top of the ascending limb, sodium ions are pumped into the medulla by active transport. The ascending limb is impermeable to water, so water remains in the tubule. This lowers the water potential of the medulla. This causes water to move out of the descending limb, which is permeable to water, by osmosis. The descending limb is not permeable to ions, meaning that the filtrate becomes more concentrated. At the bottom of the ascending limb, sodium ions diffuse into the medulla, which further lowers the water potential in the medulla. Note that this system is called a countercurrent multiplier, i.e. the overall effect is multiplied by the length of the loop. The countercurrent flow means that the filtrate in the collecting duct with a lower water potential meets interstitial fluid that has an even lower water potential, meaning that the water potential gradient is maintained along the entire length of the collecting duct, so as much water as possible can move out of these tubules by osmosis. 
now that we have created a lower water potential in the interstitial fluid around the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, more water is able to leave the tubule. All the water that leaves these tubules at this stage is reabsorbed into the capillary network. Finally, how do we control how much water is reabsorbed at the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct? Water can only leave the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct through aquaporins embedded in the cell surface membrane of cells lining these tubules. Note that aquaporins are channels that allow water to move from one side of a membrane to the other by osmosis. If we have a low blood water potential, this is detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. The posterior pituitary gland is stimulated to release more ADH into the blood. ADH binds to receptors in the cell surface membrane of cells lining the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, hereby triggering vesicles containing aquaporins to fuse with the cell surface membranes. This means that more aquaporins are incorporated into the cell surface membranes of cells lining the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, making these tubules more permeable to water, as there are more places for water to leave by osmosis, meaning that more water can leave these tubules and is reabsorbed into the blood by osmosis. Therefore, less water is lost and urine is more concentrated. The opposite happens if there is a high blood water potential. This is detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. The posterior pituitary gland releases less ADH into the blood, meaning that less ADH molecules bind to receptors in the cell surface membrane of cells lining the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, meaning that less aquaporin-containing vesicles are triggered to fuse with the cell surface membranes, so less aquaporins are incorporated into the cell surface membranes. These tubules become less permeable to water as there are less places for water to leave by osmosis, so less water can be reabsorbed into the blood by osmosis. Overall, more water is lost and urine is more dilute. Great, that would be the control of blood water potential covers. We have covered how osmoregulation is the control of the water potential of the blood. We have covered the roles of the hypothalamus, the posterior pituitary gland and ADH in osmoregulation. We have covered the structure of the nephron and its role in the formation of the glomerular filtrate, the reabsorption of glucose and water by the proximal convoluted tubule, the maintaining of a gradient of sodium ions in the medulla by the loop of Henle, as well as the reabsorption of water by the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts. That would be it for now guys, thanks for watching, please subscribe, comment, next time we will be covering inheritance.